Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Jack X podcast. I am joined today with Kevin Smith from Spine 3D. Very exciting. Uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation today about some, well, a lot of things, really. Real, you know, 3D visualizations, VR, AR, you know, the whole lot. So first of all, hi, Kevin, and, you know, thank you for being here with us. Hello, Carrie, and it's a pleasure to uh, join you all virtually. Let's just start off right at the basics. Mm -hmm. First off, what does Spine 3D do? And if you wouldn't mind, could you just like intro your role into the company? Because obviously you're an important figure in all this. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll try to uh, give you a, a, a pretty detailed uh, response to this. I mean, for you listeners who may not know, Spine's an advanced visualization studio. We're based out of South Florida. Uh, what started out as what we like to think of as a metaphor for design. The name SPINE also has recently evolved into an acronym that we like to refer to as spatial interactive experiences. But my team, they specialize in the creation of digital content for marketing and design purposes. And these assets include 3D modeling, renderings, animation, video production, VR experiences, AR filters, and web application development. And at Spine, uh, we, you know, we continually strive to achieve the highest level of quality and realism. Spine is considered a true powerhouse when it comes to producing digital content. We specialize in the creation of visual assets for real estate developers, ad agencies uh, like Jack Morton, construction companies, product manufacturers, real estate agencies, designers, uh, and world-class destinations. But you know what helps separate Spine from our competition is that my partners and the majority of my staff are architecturally trained mm. and we have a passion for design. And, and this bodes well when it comes to taking simple sketches or ideas from our clients and really bringing them to life. And um, aside from being one of the co-founders of Spine, I'm the public face of the company. Uh, even though I started as an architect and an artist, my true strength is, according to my partners, is building relationships with clients, uh, sales, handling pitches, presentations like this, contract negotiations, and really just doing my best to help fuel and expand my team. I mean, and it's why I said it right at the top of the call, right? Because we're talking about such a you know, wide expansion when we talk about these high quality visualizations, there's really just such a wide array of applications that we could talk about across almost every industry at every level, whether you're talking about at kind of the business necessity versus kind of employee engagement mm -hmm. versus marketing. You know, it seems like there's all these layers. Have you guys been building on these layers over the years? Did you kind of start in one place and the, the rest kind of just started to come to you? Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, I'm an architect by trade, right? And when I worked at AECOM, we did all the visuals within that company. I mean, you had talked about 300 people just in the Miami office alone. And, you know, when, when, we, uh, when I opened up my own company, the natural progression was, well, let's just produce renderings and animations for other architectural firms. That's what we knew. Um, mm. I had really not no engagement with an agency before or a real estate developer, not directly. So um, as we built our company, we realized that it's a very intricate web of clients with different needs. Um, and that's when we started, you know, on getting a better understanding for, well, these visual assets kind of translate across multiple industries. And um, that's when we started, you know, offering animation. Eventually, we started offering 360 tours, VR experiences as the technology evolved. But also, um, we were even introduced to product manufacturers, which I hadn't really thought about when I opened the company. Um, and, you know, products are continually being developed, being improved, and uh, they always have, you know, a need for visual assets. So yeah, I, a lot has... Uh, a lot of layers have been introduced, both in terms of from a client perspective, as well as with the types of products and solutions that we've uh, offered to them. Mm. And I'm sure with that, it's the same, you know, with the technology that you use, right? You start in one place and then as the popularity of this grows, I'm sure that's 
this is not anywhere what you thought we'd be talking about when you started the company. And then now all of a sudden we're talking about essentially the, the three deification of the entire web. Now it's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting place to be. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you know, when I taught at uh, Florida international university, I had a specialized lab there. Um, it was really um, an experimental lab where, you know, yes, they would learn how to, you know, render, they would learn how to animate, they'd learn how to 3D model. But um, we were always even pushing the envelope back then. And this is going back like 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, where virtual reality was just in its infancy. Hmm. So, you know, trying to figure out how we could kind of walk through designs, explore making changes, uh, critique the work together as a class and multiplayer. Um, these were things that were very, very early on. The only thing is, is that we felt or I felt as a company, the quality wasn't uh, on par with what we could deliver, uh, you know, through our traditional methods. Hmm. Well, actually, do you mind if we talk about that a little bit? Because obviously, you know, as you say, you're expanding. What software are you guys using right now? What is kind of the main driver of your process and, and what you're developing nowadays? Well, for creating what we deem as traditional digital assets, we use 3D Studio Max, we use V-Ray, we use Adobe Photoshop, After Effects, and Final Cut yeah. Pro. And for these traditional visual assets, which are typically 3D renderings, animation sequences, or 360 tours, we like to go through three levels of production, the process. And you know, level one, it consists of 3D modeling and camera angle confirmation. Level two involves initial material mapping and lighting. Level three concludes with advanced lighting, rendering, and post imaging. And for interactive applications or VR experiences, we typically start by creating the models in 3D Studio Max. And once the models are ready, we import the geometry into the Unreal Engine, which we love. And we're now using version five. But uh, inside UE5 that we call UE5, we create the materials, the textures, and we set up the scene lighting. And once we have the look and the feel mostly dialed in, we begin programming the interactive features using blueprint coding. And we also use Photoshop for texture editing. And for augmented reality, we have a subscription to uh, Zapper. But mm. it should be noted that we also like to use Basecamp. Um, maybe you guys are familiar with that as well. Um, and we use that to manage remote communications for each and every project that's fine. You know, files, comments, and updates can be shared throughout the production process. We like it because it holds our team accountable for keeping things on schedule and showing our client each iteration before finalizing the project. And, and it also holds our clients accountable for getting us the information and feedback in a timely manner, as well as tracking approvals along the way. It's so amazing to think about, and you know, we hear about, I think, the amount of different platforms that you're using your software combinations and you know what jack does is similar right and often in times mm -hmm. there's this little bit of people don't know the full process of designing anything top to bottom let alone something in a digital space where you kind of have to start mapping it out and, and to create a feel uh, a feel for something um so it's interesting to hear you talking about that and especially like Gosh, with this new generation of Unity, Unreal, how we're being able to use these engines, these developer engines to create real-time 3D rendering is just a total game changer for, I mean, us, but for you guys. I mean, talk about a massive jump forward. That total. It's super exciting. I mean, again, you know, as somebody who was heavily involved with VR even 15, 20 years ago, I was inspired by... Um, the science fiction novel from uh, William Gibson called Neuromancer and Snow Crash. And they talked about the metaverse. And it's kind of funny how everybody's using the metaverse term. I know he gets a little bit upset about it because uh, it's overused. And I don't think people truly understand what the metaverse is. But ultimately, um, to see how the advancements in the software have now enabled us to, as Spine, as a, as a company, to deliver visual content that is truly convincing, tr truly photorealistic and immersive and multiplayer is just mind blowing. And, you know, in terms of tech on a technical side, um, one of the biggest game changers for us as well 
And I don't know if you, you're aware of this, but like in 3D Studio Max and V-Ray and our, our more traditional applications, when you have to render out, you know, thousands and thousands of frames uh, to create these animation trailers, they can take weeks. And we have render farms that, you know, hundreds, hundreds of processors that are running around the clock, very expensive, very time consuming. But to have something in real time in the engine where you can make adjustments on the fly to the lighting, the texturing, the reflections, dial in, dial in everything um, to get it exactly how you want and not have to wait, you know, overnight or over the weekend to see that something didn't come out right. It It is a game changer. Mm -hmm. It really is. And a lot of people don't really understand. I was, uh, I was with EY and we were, uh, you know, presenting this project and people were looking at an animation trailer, but what they didn't realize is that it was pulled right from the engine. So there was no smoke and mirrors. There was no post-production. We were basically showing them an animation that if you ran the real time experience, mm. it was the same yeah. quality wise. <laughs> yes. Big brain. You know, and, and it's like with anything, right? I'm sure that for a lot for you all, it's about how much of the picture is decided ahead of time, you know, what decisions kind of need to be made in the process to really inform that briefing. And then of course, uh, you know, kind of moving forward with whatever level of finish you want to. So understand, you know, that, yeah, that variation is always interesting per project. And does that change really when you're talking about, does, does your approach change at all really when you start talking about obviously the difference between a flat render is one thing, but when you start to look at the design process for creating these ultra realistic environments, uh, do you usually kind of start with the same process every time or is there variation in that? Um, it generally goes through a similar process. I mean, you know, every interactive project begins with some research, you know, whether it's the study of the content, the clients provided us, you know, sometimes they'll give us sketches, they'll give us reference photographs, they'll give us mood boards, finding the references for the environment or finding the assets to be implemented into the application. I mean, that's the starting point. Um, I mean, although there are embellish embellishments made, you know, when we're given creative license or to produce something more surreal, our CG creations are usually similar in accuracy to the level of, of information we're provided. I mean, we always are aiming to deliver that photorealistic quality, whether it's a rendering, an animation, a tour, a VR experience. I mean, that's our, our end goal. I mean, I could give you a, a, an example. Um, this was a really, really cool project that we did, but Spine was approached. We created a project um, for Cartier. Uh, it was called A Voyage Through Time. And, and they approached us to create a time-lapse VR experience. And using photographs from their archives, we reconstructed the corner of Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street in 1910, in 1970, and 2016. And the main objective for them was to show the Cartier mansion that, you know, had remained unchanged or timeless um, over that period. But again, you know, going through these photographs, trying to match the, the materials in each time period, um, it was pretty amazing. And when you look at, you know, the, the actual end product for any of those, they look like photographs. It's pretty amazing. That's incredible. And was that particular piece uh, interactive or was that more of just kind of a linear, uh, a linear content piece? Unfortunately, that wasn't really interactive. Um, and I forget which movie it was inspired from. It was um, there was a there was a movie that we had seen where somebody was kind of putting on a, a VR headset and they were thumbing through like everything from the prehistoric age to modern mm -hmm. times. And uh, ultimately what they wanted was you to be able to either through YouTube, um, a video online or put on a VR headset, which is really wild. You're standing on the street corner across from the Cartier mansion and you see, for instance, you're standing there in 1910. And I encourage you to go to our website and check it out under the features page, but you'll see all the storyboards and everything like that. But you see horse drawn carriages kind of going by you on the street and you, you're in kind of like a black and white environment. And then it just like maybe five, 10 seconds later, it trans, it like dissolves into 1970 where you see people with bell bottoms and checkered cabs going by. And then it transfers to 2016 when we had built it. And you're seeing, you know, uh, you know, 
a modern representation, but how it just seamlessly transfers in from one time period to the next, it's just amazing. And you can kind of look around from a, a static uh, viewpoint. Hmm. It's so interesting, you know, the role of content has changed so much. And especially for, you know, an organization like Jack, where we're focused so much on experience. I think people don't necessarily always mm -hmm. appreciate how much content is at the heart of the experience or that it's it's usually doing one thing. It's usually it's either content is the experience or it's supporting the experience. Um, and so sure. this role of storytelling and being able to present a kind of compelling story and, and bringing people into it um, has been such a driver in these past few years for us, but it sounds like for you all as well. It is all about storytelling. I mean, obviously, you know, you want to have compelling content, you know, very, very photorealistic, at least for us. And then, you know, with a good story, it really draws the audience in, makes them want to walk through it more. I mean, I, I always joke around with my, my, my uh, sons who play video games. I'm not so much of a gamer. I like to actually create the content, not play it. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more fascinated when I go into some of these, like, amazing titles that you'll see right now, whether it's VR or not. And I just like walking around and exploring, you know, looking around and not having to worry about, you know, fighting for my life, but more uh, just looking at the details and just be walking around and exploring almost like a scavenger hunt. So um, again, but a good story can really help, you know, sell a product, sell an experience. And, you know, our team gets really excited when we're working with companies like Jack to, to tell that story, a really good story that makes people come back and want to see more. It's not just mm -hmm. about, you know, a, a one-time deal. No, absolutely. That compelling nature is so important. And then how do you combine that with, you know, the element of interaction? Obviously, that's built, that's been building for you all, you know, just like the rest of it, right? The building on the complexity of, oh, you know, okay, I want to be able to spin this visual around. Okay, now I want to be able to stand in the middle. Now I want to be able to walk through. <laughs> now I want to be able to interact with it. You know, what's that journey been like for you all? I mean, I would say for any of our 360 tours or the VR builds that we produce, interact, interactivity is a key component. I mean, it helps enhance the environments and the products we created for our clients and may consist of, but it's not limited to the following. Like we, we do hotspots that when you select them, they open up modal windows uh, where you can access copy, photo galleries, uh, you can get video content, links to websites. I mean, you name it. For product interactivity, it includes like things like sound, clicking on QR codes, printing out, downloading PDF files to share with your colleagues, opening up a shopping cart, the whole e-commerce thing is huge, swapping out materials, colors, components, so much. And for environments, interactivity includes changing the time of day, the seasons, the backgrounds, swapping out furnishings, finishes. And what I really like is the gamification aspects. So you can earn badges or credits by completing certain tasks. Um, I mean, I would be more than happy to share a few examples of yeah, how please. interactivity helped take things to the next level for some of our clients. Um, and, you know, I, I would love, you know, again, you can go to our website and you can see some of these things, but um, I'll just share a few examples like when it, comes to talking about interactivity. Um, LX Houses, um, they're a subsidiary of LG. Uh, I had never heard of them. Um, when I think of LG, I think of appliances and electronics, but they came to Spine for a kitchen countertop configurator. And this was like during the COVID uh, period. And their initial idea was to utilize a photograph of a kitchen and basically use Photoshop to mask out the counter, swap out a series of their finishes. And really, honestly, I, I was not convinced or my team that it would look good with the lighting and the reflections. So we convinced them to transform this idea into a true virtual experience. And to pull it off, what we did is we designed a showroom that consisted of four kitchens, four bathrooms, a lobby, and a slab viewing room. And the customer basically can tour the showroom via desktop by clicking on a simple URL. And, and once you select a given kitchen or a bathroom, you can design the space to your liking, 
selecting from their family of services. So they have countertops, they have cabinets, they have walls, they have flooring. And basically it's tied to a PDF generator where you can save your configuration. You can easily share it with family and friends. This was such a success. They took the showroom to trade shows after COVID had uh, died down. They set up a more immersive tour in their headquarters that you can walk through with a VR headset. And they have the ability to scale this experience by adding floors in the future. So it started out as a simple rendering request, ended up becoming something much, much more interactive and immersive. Um, the second example, which I thought was super cool, there was a company called House. And this is a company that is really focused on things that you wouldn't you wouldn't imagine they would be looking for something immersive or virtual, but they were celebrating their hundred year anniversary. They, they actually do engine detergents and lubricants for the trucking industry. And they came to Spine to create a 360 Hall of Fame. And prior to coming to Spine, they had created a, a really, really um, unconvincing animation trailer that kind of took you through some type of museum and kind of revealed uh, some pillars and showed off some of the uh, inductees. But ultimately they came to Spine because they were looking to induct members into the hall in a more interactive way. So we initially created this virtual exhibition hall. We actually modeled it uh, after an old train station. I think back to that movie, The Untouchables, uh, but to unveil their Hall of Fame inductees. And the visitor basically has the ability to walk through the following environments. There's a gas station, it's in the winter, so there's like snow falling. There's a farm with like a silo and cows and chickens. Uh, there's a desert setting. They actually had a, a product called a diesel defender and they had a bunch of ninjas that were all like prowling around this like desert environment. And basically there's a series of hotspots for like watching videos to learn about the history of the company, uh, about the inductees, their different product line, how do they relate to the specific environment, their stage within, so much. And it was such a success on their website, they ended up having us convert the project into an immersive version that could be experienced with a VR headset at their trade shows. We actually did it with, uh, it was built for Altspace because they wanted to have a multiplayer VR headset version. Um, we're not too happy with the quality that Altspace can deliver. Um, if I had to do it myself, we would basically probably build it in the Unreal Engine. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple more examples. I mean, using the Unreal Engine, we created a car configurator for BMW. I know Jack Morton is famous for being in the automotive industry and you've got some amazing work. But, you know, we created a car configurator for BMW where the end user can orbit around the vehicle in real time. They can turn on the headlights, they can open and close the doors, they can swap out the colors, the rims. Uh, you can also swap out the environments if you want to. Um, Asa Abloy, this is a really cool example. They actually were based out of Sweden and they focus on uh, really advanced door opening solutions, uh, super secure. So when you think about Minority Report where, you know, It'll scan your the retina and you'll, your thumbprints, that type of thing. And they initially came to us to create a digital city. And prior to reaching out to Spine, they had a custom RV that would travel from city to city that contained a variety of their door opening solutions. And I said, whoa, you know, let's let's maybe focus on a more concentrated area. And we ended up designing a virtual campus to showcase their product in a more engaging, interactive way. And what we did, um, Carrie, is we, we started with a, a university building. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, school shootings here in the United States. Um, they wanted to really focus on security. Uh, we added on healthcare, and we recently added on kindergarten through 12. And they're looking to expand in 2023 by adding other market sectors mm -hmm. and really have the opportunity to embed QR codes into the VR experience so the user can place their door hardware in the real world. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Studio Shed. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people were looking for more than just a shed. Uh, they call them ADUs, they're accessory dwelling units, but they could be art studios, an office, a man cave, a she shed. Um, you know, we started by taking one of their most popular sheds, it was called the Summit Series, 
that they wanted to configure. And we pitched this really cool idea of creating a virtual backyard. And I don't know if you remember, I might be dating myself, but there was a, a show called Home Improvement where Tim Allen, you know, would be doing the doing his uh, do-it-yourself projects. And he, there was some times where he would walk in the backyard and there was a guy like peered over the fence. You the never neighbor, saw like, yeah. his full face. Yeah, so <laughs> we, 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 we had this idea of like creating this like virtual home improvement backyard. And we really pushed interact activity all the way with this shed. I mean, you can not only swap out three different sizes in the backyard, but you could show what each shed looks like when it's furnished as a studio, a gym, a living space. And each application that you select allows for a full customer configuration. So you can mm. swap out the materials, um, the finishes. And ultimately the idea was for Studio Shed to expand the backyard concept and add more products, whether that's going into your neighbor's backyard or just expanding the backyard concept. But again, interactivity really like opens up the doors to like a myriad of possibilities for the client. And it's just super exciting. I mean, it, it just keeps going. Yeah. And, you know, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Kevin, because uh, everything that you're describing there, and I think a lot of these newer applications and especially we were talking about at the beginning of, of our conversation around this emergence of the entire web on the precipice of becoming 3D. But interested if you're in the same place currently, I'm in this place where I'm telling clients this new 3 Dification, new way of exploring, new approach to storytelling is an opportunity to test out new types of relationships with customers. It's an opportunity yeah. to test out how something can grow. And so we always say, mm -hmm. you know, don't make it do everything all at once, but make it so that it sure. can scale, make it so that it can grow. And it seems like you guys are taking a similar approach with customers of being like, Let's try a new type of interaction that you could have with customers. And if that works, you can build on top of it and you can add a range and, and add opportunities. Yeah. I mean, our clients are all about ROI, right? I mean, uh, because they're so, uh, they're not as informed. A lot of our clients, I find they're, they're not as informed with virtual reality. They hear about the buzzwords with metaverse and meta and, you know, virtual reality and, they're interested, they're intrigued, but they really want to know what it's going to do for them. It's not just a gimmick. So, you know, we always try to first convince them maybe it might be good to start with like a pilot project. So just like with Studio Shed, you know, we start with a simple shed, a, you know, a backyard concept, and we can expand from there. Scalability is key. And, you know, especially when you're talking about clients like LX Houses that I, I talked about or House, they always have new products going into the market and these products come out every quarter. They could even come out every month, but they're looking at ways to unveil new products. And what better way to do that is to start with this virtual environment and just keep adding on areas, you know, spaces that you can continue to journey through, um, teleport to. So that's, what's so exciting. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we're so accustomed, especially like in the trade show space, you know, you're accustomed to being confined to a, a 10 by 10 booth, you know, a, yeah. a 20 by 20 booth. And, you know, with VR, it can be as big as you want. I mean, a good example, um, you know, Dursey, uh, they're a, a big client of ours and they came to Spine during the pandemic because one of the largest, most rep they're, they're actually one of the largest, most reputable designers and manufacturers of trade show exhibit spaces. And they had almost a hundred percent cancellation of their orders. I mean, they closed down all the uh, trade shows, but they were savvy enough to team up with spine to create virtual showrooms to reach a broader, more remote audience. So again, rather than being confined to that 10 by 10, 20 by 20, 40 by 40 booth, their clients can create any experience virtually. So again, like, you know, it could be a football field that you could walk through. It doesn't have mm. to be this small confined space. And, and again, scalability is, is key. Um, you know, the, the beauty of, uh, of creating these virtual experiences is that now they're like a companion to the exhibit space. Um, you know, they don't, they can be scaled, they can be refreshed with new content. They don't have to be physically constructed in a warehouse, shipped from city to city. 
They don't have to be stored. They can capture metrics using Google Analytics. They can be accessed from any device and they can always be converted into a real-time walkthrough like with a VR headset. But, um, you know, yeah, scalability is huge. Yeah, and so, and then, I mean, I think we would both agree that, you know, these visualizations, uh, you know, 3D modeling, the, the quality of which we're going to exploration, this is only going to get bigger. Um, this is only becoming more of the norm for people and, and more, uh, you know, demanded, I think, from a point of view of, of a consumer experience of having these attached or extended bits, these these different ways to engage. I mean, for, for you all, where do you see this kind of influencing spine? Where are you guys seeing as far as you're planning for the future? Is it kind of more you're planning uh, for those game development? Is it creation? Is it VR? What's exciting you guys? Well, it's all about onward and upward. I mean, the spine team is interested in pushing the envelope when it comes to constructing virtual environments that allow for the end user to access content in new, innovative and immersive ways. Um, you know, we just partnered up with Ready Player Me uh, and we're experimenting with Unreal's MetaHuman to push the boundaries when it comes to avatar creation. We also just partnered with Trueverse. I'm actually meeting with them later today and Mitaverse on a platform that will reimagine men's editorial content. We're excited about the possibilities with pixel streaming now that, you know, it allows easier access to these VR experiences from any device with no lapse in quality or performance. I mean, basically, as digital architects, we're always imagining what things are, are going to look like in the future. Quality is paramount for us. I mean, no questions asked. Um, augmented reality is an area we're growing in as well. I love giving our clientele the ability to place their digital assets in real world applications. I mean, it's so mm -hmm. cool. I mean, being able to take a car that you scan in your application and drop it in your driveway and walk around it and look at the details. It's incredible. Um, you know, after being at... I was very, very fortunate to be able to attend EY's strategic growth forum a couple of weeks ago. And the buzzword that kept coming up throughout was disruptive innovation. And as more and more companies demand, you know, rich, compelling virtual experiences, content will be the driving force to be reckoned with. I mean, our collective vision at Spine is that we're going to continue to push the envelope, create beautiful digital content that disrupts what is being produced by, you know, larger more recognizable players in the market. I mean, you know, every time, you know, I don't have to mention names, but when you walk through a lot of VR experiences, the avatars don't look convincing. The environments are not up to par with what we're delivering, you know, for some of our business applications. So to me, you know, it's all about the quality. It's all about the storytelling. That was such an awesome um, natural finish, Kevin. Well, well done. That was a really nice uh, summation. Um, this has been awesome. I feel like we've covered all of our big topics. Is there anything you feel like you haven't gotten a chance to say or you want to get included before we wrap up? Um, you know, I mean, just because I know my team would love to hear about it, I would love to just mention a couple of our favorite projects uh, that we've worked on because we've done so many. I mean, it's very subjective, but I'd love to share a few of our favorites. Our favorite when it came to like putting together like architectural design, um, we did this project for Home of the Brave. It was a nonprofit and they basically reached out to us during the pandemic to have us create a, it was called the VFR Retreat. And it was basically a retreat to provide healing for those who serve, such as first responders, service members, military veterans, and working just from like simple ideas, no CAD drawings, nothing. The spine team designed the entire property, which basically consisted of a wellness center. There were 60 cottages. There were 12 to 15 larger cottages for like families in need. There was a greenhouse, a wedding or event barn. There was equestrian stables. It just went on and on, and it's currently going through fundraising efforts in hopes that they build this first retreat somewhere in Ohio. So that was a really cool project that really focused our our abilities in the design space. And uh, in terms of um, technology, we partnered up with a company called Trueverse uh, earlier this year. And by using VR, Web3, blockchain technology, they basically aim to reinvigorate and transform the world of men's editorial and share a new way to experience the content in the metaverse. I mean, imagine going into like 
a virtual men's health or GQ where you can actually access new articles. You can find out about products in an immersive way. And since we're only, you know, we were only provided with a general interactive concept, we basically used a significant amount of creative license, which resulted in designing what we refer to as the VR stash house. Um, we were inspired by this movie. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Free Guy, where Ryan Reynolds has this like man cave where he stores his collectibles. And using the Unreal Engine, we custom designed a three level house that's set into a real cliff in Norway. And the first level is called Dream. It's an outdoor environment where you can swim in a pool that cantilevers out over the cliff. It's crazy. It, it'll test your uh, your fear of heights. Uh, you can chill in the Zen garden. You can walk to a pav pavilion and watch video content. You can take an elevator down to the second level, which includes a kitchen, a living room, a bedroom, a bathroom. And then there's a play level, which is the most subterranean level. And it includes a golf simulator, a car storage garage, a billiard room. There's even like a walk the plank. You can like walk out on the cliff, over the cliff. But basically the overarching concept was that this VR environment could be sponsored. It could be hosted by different clients to host meetings, private parties, events, mm -hmm. incorporating NFTs, showcasing products as they're needed. So basically the stash house is just the first small piece of what's gonna become a larger metaverse or what they refer to as the true verse. That is all about scalability. And lastly, um, we also do video production. Um, you know, a lot of people don't really know this, but you know, for AutoNation, they're one of our bigger automotive clients. They did a pitch uh, for Porsche. And in four weeks, the team basically constructed three dealership locations in South Florida. And it involved 3D modeling, rendering, camera matching, animation. We also rented a, a Porsche Taycan. We secured permits to block off the roads, hired a professional driver, assisted with storyboarding, handled all film production, rented the camera crane, and we handled all post-production. So it's not just digital. We like, again, we also get involved with video production when needed. So anyway, that's a, that was pretty much it. I mean, we're just uh, thrilled to be working, uh, you know, with these types of clients, these types of projects and, Ultimately, I just really appreciate Scott Varland um, for introducing us to your agency. I do have a childhood friend, Rob Parker, that has worked there for a number of years. I actually went to kindergarten with him. Um, so that's a small world. And I just hope we get an opportunity to collaborate together sooner than later. Ah, I love it. No, Kevin, this has been so great and so helpful. You know, to be able to just talk through, I mean, like we've been saying kind of throughout, you guys are situated in such an interesting industry from the point of growth, really, and from the point of application. Mm -hmm. And so having these conversations yeah. about what can be done, why it should be done, how it can be done, you know, mm -hmm. is so fascinating and hopefully is opening up a lot of ideas in people's heads. So thank you for, for talking us through all that and for sharing so much of your valuable knowledge with us. Oh, uh, no, no. It, it was a pleasure. And um, I hope your uh, audience are able to learn some things about Spine. And, you know, if they want to find out more about our projects, um, just go to Spine3D.com and just kind of peruse through the different uh, sections and check out our work. And Absolutely. keep an eye on us because we're doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, the coolest thing right now, uh, and it's, it's truly a dream project, thanks to Jack, is uh, we're working with EY on a project that I can't share due to confidentiality, but it is, it's a dream project. So super And when cool. it comes and out, when we'll you get can. a chance to finally show that. Yeah. Yes, we <laughs> definitely would love to show it if we're, if we're able to. <laughs> when you can. Well, that's a good reason for people to keep checking back in on the website. The link will be in yeah, the description below. Yeah. So everyone, please, you know, mm -hmm. keep checking in on Kevin and the team uh, to see all the amazing work that they're going through. And it's, it's definitely work that deserves looking at it because that is what it is designed to do and not just hearing us talk about it. Uh, so head over there, yeah. check it out and, and reach out to Kevin and the team and thank you so much kevin thank you very much this was uh this is great and my first podcast uh wow i did it <laughs> <laughs>